And welcome to another Sheffield uh, lecture and debate. Um, this one um, is Don't Shoot Me, I'm a Filmmaker. Well, um, I'm not a filmmaker anymore, I was. Um, I'm now a commissioning editor, so um, it has a slightly different, uh, different tone to me, because sometimes you do want to shoot a filmmaker. But uh, <laughs> um, for, for the purposes of uh, purposes this afternoon, um, it's, this is actually, a, I think, a really interesting and potential debate. Um, I'm Kevin Sutcliffe. I'm the Deputy Head of News and Current Affairs Channel 4. Um, I guess I'm sat here because I send a lot of people abroad. Uh, I send them to very dangerous places through dispatches and previously an unreported world. Um, and increasingly over the last few years, uh, it's been obvious that it's become more dangerous, more difficult to be a filmmaker, uh, trying to bring stories back, trying to get to stories around the world. Um, I think it's um, easy to say now that filmmakers are targets along with everybody else. Uh, it used to be that you could talk your way out of most situations in the uh, distant past when I was uh, a producer, you could probably talk your way past a roadblock or you could probably get yourself out of a sticky situation. I think it's a lot different now. Uh, and broadcasters um, and freelance journalists are now finding it tougher to bring those stories back that in a way we all take for granted that we see, you see a fantastic Afghanistan film or you see something in the Philippines. Uh, you see these things taken for granted and what goes into those, the risks that are taken uh, by the filmmakers and the people involved on the ground are now, I think, greater and more enormous than they were, say, five or six years ago. So I'm hoping that today we can have uh, quite a wide-ranging discussion just about what faces you if you go abroad and you want to make a film. Uh, these are moral, ethical, as well as safety issues. Um, there's a fantastic range of people here uh, who are going to offer you insights and I hope also discuss amongst themselves uh, some of the issues they face and faced when they, they made their programmes. I know for, as a broadcaster we take safety very, very seriously. It's a real balance between preventing the films, preventing the stories coming out and keeping people safe. Keep people, keep people, keeping people safe uh, who are making the films and those who are in them, which is another issue I hope we'll talk about today. Who gets left behind uh, when the filmmakers have gone and what happens to them is as possibly as important as the filmmakers coming back and their films being shown. So, uh, with me uh, are Tim Hetherington. Uh, who, uh, it says here, uh, was the only photographer to live behind rebel lines during the 2003 Liberian Civil War. Uh, you may actually know him more recently for Restrepo, which is a fantastic film doing the rounds at the moment. It won Sundance. Uh, it's in cinemas near you, I think, at the moment, Tim? I think so, yeah, it's on UK release. Uh, we've got Laura Patras, a uh, filmmaker. Uh, she received a Peabody Award and was nominated for an Emmy for uh, Flag Wars Country in 2003 and I think nominated for an Academy Award and an Emmy mm -hmm. as well. Um, Havana Marking, who everybody must have seen at Afghan Star, which is a fantastic piece. Um, and she's going to talk about the follow-up to, to Afghan Star, which uh, I think gave you quite a lot of issues and you're making it that surprised you, you didn't expect. Um, the far end, James Brabazon, uh, filmmaker and author, it says here. Uh, James uh, made a film for me, uh, My Friend the Mercenary, which he's now turned into a book, uh, which I recommend to anyone. Um, and uh, at the moment, are you making something at the moment, James? I'm working with this really difficult commissioning editor. It's giving me a really hard time. <laughs> I'm uh, making a film about um, oil for um, Channel 4. Uh, and uh, Jezza Newman uh, from True Vision. Uh, Jezza has made several films for me, um, and he's been undercover in Tibet. Uh, he uh, was part of the uh, China Stolen Children, a big film uh, of a couple of years back for Dispatches. So what I'm hoping is individually everybody will show a clip and then talk about an issue from the clip they want, they want to bring up and tell you how they made it. I think that's what we'll do. We'll have a clip bit of sync, clip, bit of sync. Um, and then at the end, I think, if anybody's got questions. Now, I know Tim has to go early, but if, if when he's speaking, uh, you, somebody does have a burning question for him, or if anybody has a burning question they don't understand while we're going through this, uh, we'll, you know, we can stop and have a bit of a chit chat. But what I'd not like to happen is really 20 minutes on each piece. I'd like the discussion at the end, if that's possible. So I was gonna ask 
to play the first clip, which is Tim Hetherington's, uh, and then for Tim to talk off the back of that uh, yeah, sure. about a couple of the issues that were raised in the making. It was, uh, it was, it was chaos. And when we finally had a, a second to, to stop and think, that's when I realized that one of my good friends had, had gone, you know, and I started hearing uh, about Sergeant Rice, Vandenberg. I didn't even know that they had been hit at that point. And I need yeah, time out. Hold on. <clears throat> I'm just trying to keep my train of thought. Hey, I need immediate suppression on 2251. The enemy's pushed up on the high ground with two forward one. Two one ground where two fours location five one two two five five if you got eight tens i want gun runs from either from east to west coming in okay taken over by the enemy the hill right here the hill down there. Wildcat all right we're gonna go around it's easy to go around yeah, that hill. hey abdul yeah. get the fuck over here tell these guys Hey, he wants us to go up over this hill and bum rush. There's fucking dudes right there. If we do that, we're gonna have to fucking lay down. Some, we're gonna have to lay down fire first. Yeah, but we don't. Yes, but we, we can't get a hold of them. We don't know. We don't know where they're at. That's why we're gonna have to lay down fire first. Right over here. Okay? Yeah, no. Hey, who's down? We got Sergeant Rogel and them up? Hey. What? Yeah. Hey, just give me a chance, bro. Give me Hey, you know what, what do you want me at? Come on, someone saw the fucking fire. They're coming. Get down. Get down. What? Get down. What? What's going on? Just chill, chill out, dude. Chill, out. Hey, chill the fuck out. Chill out. Who's over there? Who's over there? Oh my god. Hey, shut up. No, I'm not. Man. Shut up. Oh, no, there's still guys out here. Okay, let's go ahead and move. All right. Oh, man. Oh, it's all right. It's alive, dude. Yeah, it's good. He's alive. He's going to make it, dude. There's nothing we can do. Where's everybody else? Hey, we got guys. We got friendlies here. Yeah. Friendlies to our six right here. Hey, Ferg, all right? Who's your first friend? Hey, Solo. Vandenberg's here. Vandenberg's already got him. He's been getting him. He's already stable right now. Fight it back right now. That ain't sorry. Two six, two six, two three. <laughs> you lying, right, man? Hey, okay. <laughs> why would I lie about something like that? Two six, two six, two three. Where'd he get hit? I gotta see. Don't look at him. Don't look at him. Tell me, don't look at him. Tell me, don't look at him. It was quick. Don't look at him. It was quick. Two one. Two one. This was good. Nothing we can do. Okay, okay. Right, hey, sit down. Where, where, where the bad guys at? Battle six Romeo's is two six. I pushed the side of the uh, KA break. Right now we have the hilltop. It's in the same vicinity my last grid. Right now we're gonna move the wounded in action. There's two of them. Back to LZ Eagles. I'm also when Captain Kearney told me um, up by the LZ that uh, Staff Sergeant, you know, Rugal uh, was killed. It was uh, it was gut wrenching. Um, you know, there's different levels to quality of fighters. He was one of the best, if not the best. And I think that's that was what was tough for a lot of people was was you know kind of knowing that in the back of the mind. Well. If the best guy we have out here just got killed. Where's that put me? You know, what's going to happen to me? Um, you know, what's going to happen to the guy to my left, my right? Hey, can we fucking bring him in right here? So, Tim, um, 
who let you go to war like that? Who did, how did you persuade someone uh, that that was a good idea? Um, I mean, really, I, all my, I'm, I'm coming at this as, as, a, as a, I work across visual forms, so I'm coming as, as a photographer, sometimes as an artist, sometimes uh, as a filmmaker, a TV documentarian, or whatever it is, and so I really initiate, I, I really make my own long-term projects, and these have centered on ideas of young men in conflict over the last 10 years. And, you know, sure, Vanity Fair assigned me and the writer Sebastian Junger, you know, to go to Vanity Fair initially. But obviously, they have no idea what we're getting ourselves into, and we make the judgments of what we do, and we've been doing that for a very long time. So that's not really the issue. And, um, you know, I have to say, and I'm just kind of free-ranging here, so I'll try not to ramble on too long. But, um, again, coming at, at it from a photography perspective, I think ph photographers have been through a kind of genesis or thinking about uh, this kind of imagery. Um, we, we've done a lot of soul searching as the nature of documentaries unfolded. And, um, you know, if I think about war photography and then comparing it to this kind of work, one of the things that immediately hits me is that um, photography now is, uh, is, you can't, the ideas of being an objective medium are, are totally redundant. Um, that any photographer working nowadays, although I accept the work in the press and wire photography is slightly different, but generally it's accepted that there has to be a subjective understanding of the medium. and. What I'd like to say about this clip is my biggest concern is about, uh, well, what I'll talk about is about war porn. War porn. Um, I get emails all the time from young people, usually young men at colleges, who write to me and ask me um, advice about going to a war zone. And I really don't know how to answer them, and it still troubles me. I had one the other day. And I, in making this kind of work, it often occurs to me that sometimes I'm also advocating that this is exciting, that this is glamorous, that this is war, war porn. Um, but so that is an ethical dilemma I face. I don't have answers to that question. The answers that I have to that, well, the answers that I propose that question are that we have seen this out of totally out of context. And it's very, it's very my work is, 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 is part of a larger fabric. And that larger fabric can especially be seen recently this year when Restrepo was put out there, that the web allows it to weave together all the other places that my work appear, from Liberia to Chad to, to, uh, you know, to, to the things that I've covered in West Africa for eight years. Um, and, you know, I talk about subjectivity and why I got a nip off at the moment is, is that a, f a film I've just made, which I haven't actually, I haven't seen first time, I'm going to be seeing a public viewing, is a film called Diary that we weaves together my personal life with, with the war, war images as an idea of the exploration of this subjectivity. And I'm saying about subjectivity because we chose to do an embed, um, but we embraced the idea of the subjectivity. We actually didn't try to pretend that we could uh, uh, image the whole of the Afghan conflict or give you a perspective on the Afghan war. Uh, we understood the limitations of that subjectivity and we embraced it. Um, just as I embraced my subject as a young men in war, I'm a man and in these situations, for some reason, maybe it's hardwired into me that I have the ability to have an off switch I switch in terms of getting myself into a dangerous situation. I don't have the off switch in terms of a critical, I hope I don't have the off switch in terms of a crit critical faculty. Um, but my subject is young men, and what I think is new, and people will say, well, we've seen all this before, but I think what is new when you start to understand this as a thread in the largest tapestry of what I'm doing is to have much more of, a, of, a, of an honest, I hope, and subjective reading of young men in war. And like the book I just made, Infidel, looks at male sexuality, and I think there's something definitely inherent about young men and conflict and how they're used and politicized, or how they're used as a vanguard for political purposes of which they really don't have an understanding. And I think that if Restrepo demonstrates anything, it demonstrates that we are sending young men to war to fight on our behalf without really understanding their experience and without really fully accepting their experience. And those of us for the war say that they're just doing their honor, their patriotic duty, and those against the war see them as being kind of like idiots who pull the trigger without giving them a kind of full realization of human, human beings. And so, you know, I'm weighing that up as a balance. On the one hand, I could be charged with showing war porn, and on the other hand, like, this is what I do. For some reason, I found out that I'm quite good at going into a, into a dangerous situation and keeping myself together in my, in my thoughts, being calm enough to have the off switch and do what I do. And I think I developed that over years of living in West Africa, where I lived pretty much as an outsider into situations. Uh, yeah, I was the only photographer in Liberia, but my, you know, I worked with a cameraman as well. James Brabson when we lived behind Rebel Lines. Um, and just in terms of the embeds, so that's, yeah. could, could, I mean, there are embeds and there are embeds. I mean, that's a very, that's the front line of an embed. Other embeds can pass often without in, incident. 
<coughs> what sort of support were you getting from the people who commissioned that? And what sort of prep went into trying to understand what you might face? Uh, we, I mean, we funded, produced, directed the whole film ourselves. We didn't have anybody. We, we, direct, we, we put ourselves into that situation. And we did that because after many years of covering conflict, I really, if you look at the Liberia work or other work that I've done, it's completely immersive. Uh, my art installation work is immersive. You know, this idea that I want to take, I want an emotional reading of a subject. Uh, I'm not necessarily looking to, this Restrepo isn't a political reading on the Afghan war. I mean, it's saying the Corongo Valley is representative of Afghanistan is like saying Detroit is representative of America. But it is an emotional reading of, of conflict, of combat, and what these young men go through and understanding that in a way that I think is not normally fleshed out in the media. And so, you know, we did not have guidance, but we knew ourselves where we wanted to be. And if you wanted to examine the situation of, uh, of the, 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 the experience of being in violence, of that kind of violence on that side of the fence, then the Coronel Valley was a very good place to be. And we just went in there and did it. And sure, there's times where I go into, and I've been, there's a couple of times, I mean, you always, I found, I found myself in the past in violent situations as it was a witness as a documentarian. And sure, there are certain moments where you get into it and then you're like, whoa, this is far deeper than I, I, I expected to be in, you know, and, and it's a bit like, uh, you know, it's exciting at those moments, but it's also terrifying. You didn't find, did you, did you feel yourself rather exposed? I mean, People, some people here may not know how embeds work, or they may not know how, in fact, freelance journalists work. I mean, that, that to me feels a very exposed place to be. I don't, you know, there, there's been. Do you have insurance? Huh? Do you have insurance? Yeah, I had insurance about it, yeah. yeah. But so I mean, I broke my leg out there, so. You can place insurance on, on that. You've got yourself insurance. I, I broke my leg during the, that situation and had to kind of join the same combat operation and had to get out. Um, but, you know, I mean, the. the the embed system with the American and the British Army in the recent wars has been very politicized because of, I think, one of the things about the, because of what under President Bush and the direction that the war took. And that has it's come under scrutiny. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But again, understanding that, you know, media is, is also the subjective reasons why people choose to do things. I was embedded in Liberia in a rebel army. Nobody asked me questions about that. I was embedded with Human Rights Watch. Uh, uh, you know, documenting a massacre in Chad. Nobody asked me questions about that. Um, for me, the, all those instances are pretty similar. I'm coming at it from a very subjective viewpoint. I'm really not interested in, in, in some ways, in journalism. In some ways, I'm really not interested in photography. What I'm interested in is taking you into a very emotional, subjective place inside a situation and trying to balance those two things. You know, how can we have an objective reading of the world and accept we're coming at it from a subjective viewpoint and trying to present work that balances those two, those two competing claims. And I self-direct myself into those situations, and I'll continue to do it. OK. Well, thank you. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll be around uh, towards the end for some more questions. Um, we're going to see a clip from um, Jezza Newman's Zimbabwe's Forgotten Children. Uh, this is uh, not a Channel 4 film about children abroad. Uh, it's a BBC one. Um, Jez has made films for uh, Channel 4, um, a lot of them with children in the title. Um, uh, but this one, um, I think it's an extraordinary film. Um, I'm very sad we didn't have it. Uh, could you run the clip, please? Harassment by the police is a daily occurrence here. But far more feared is the Central Intelligence Organization, whose plain clothes officers can be anywhere. Even if you've got an accreditation card, you always get pulled over. So wherever you go, you know, you're always feeling like you're watched. People stop you, and the other day, you know, when we were filming, there was a guy who came to me, and he said to me, look, I'm part of the CIO, and I felt a bit harassed. If you are clear, that's okay, but if you are not clear, then we really have problems. Mm -hmm. I really know our yeah. To say something better about it. Ah, the show, the show, yeah. and uh, this one. Yeah. 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 They are not satisfied with you just giving them the accreditation card. They want to get into the reasons why, where is the film going to be shown, what are the purposes. Hello. Hello. 
So working in Zimbabwe, uh, how hard was that? Um, it was very difficult working in Zimbabwe. Um, when we went there, we, we did have accreditation to go and make a film with Kaliswa, who you saw in the clip. Um, we had a film to go and make a, to make a film about her childhood. So we basically had to go there and make two films. One was about her childhood, and then one was about the real story behind what's going on in Zimbabwe at the moment. <clears throat> so you are effectively, it, it's working below the radar rather than working undercover, because you're there clearly, but you're doing something completely different. The main issues that I face is obviously I'm not dodging bullets like Tim might have been in his last clip that you saw. And I, he has very little control over the soldiers he's filming and what they do, what situations you put him into. However, I have an awful lot of control about what I do with contributors and where I put them. So how, we ha how I respond as a filmmaker is, a, is having a responsibility towards those contributors both before I ever enter the country, when I'm in the country, and then what happens to them afterwards. And I think one of the tools that, um, that is used right at the very beginning is known as a security protocol. And this is something that the channels, well, particularly Channel 4, I, I first filled one out with was um, on China and then Tibet. And when I went into Tibet, undercover in Tibet, we had to fill out a a security protocol. In that protocol, basically, Kevin was saying, you know, you need to work out where you're going, what are you doing, and what might happen. And I sat there and I thought, here I am writing about a hypothetical city and a hypothetical, con um, a hypothetical restaurant in this hypothetical situation, and I'm going in with these cameras, talking to this guy I haven't met yet, and suddenly secret police are going to walk in, and what am I going to do? How am I going to react? And at first I thought, this seems a bit mad. I'm writing page after page after page after situation after situation. And it's only when you're actually in the field and you are dealing with a situation acting on the ground and something goes wrong that you really realise the importance of everything you did before you ever went into that country. And with Zimbabwe, it came to its a four, because as you saw in that film, that was just a highlight of the 12 times we were interrogated by the CIO whilst we were on the ground. And each given time, you had no idea that it was going to happen. And I think that's what you're dealing with. Every day you step into Zimbabwe with, and take a camera out, you are putting yourself in the potential of being interrogated. So every time you have to have a plan for what is it you're doing, why are you doing it? Because there is physically no time, and in that instance there, there is no time to hide your rushes or dump your tape. You, there's nothing you can do. You've got to come up with a concrete reason why you're doing it. Because the person ultimately that's at greatest risk is the contributor that's helping you be there. Um, and I think that, that that is as much about the pre-planning before you ever go to the country as it is how you operate when you're um, in the country. So um, with the contributors then, um, so you've come out, you've made a, a, a really interesting film. Um, what's happened to the contributors? They're obviously at risk from talking to you while you were there. You've come away with the film. Uh, you broadcast it. It's obviously been going to be seen in Zimbabwe, whatever, whatever precautions you take. So what's happened to those contributors? So for the contributors, obviously, um, in this instance in Zimbabwe, um, first of all, you have to, um, when you're putting the, the film together, you're firstly looking at what are they actually saying in the film? How critical are they of the government? And, um, and that's looked at by the channel. And it, there was a, an instance in this film where the, 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 on that interrogation, we're actually filming with a man and his two daughters who collect rubbish and sell it and collect bo animal bones to sell for sugar refining. So obviously, you're walking around a rubbish dump collecting um, bones is clearly not something that they're going to want you to see. When we, um, he was also involved in the um, cleanup operation in Zimbabwe. And on the first cut, he actually talked about the cleanup operation, but talked about it in a very directly critical way. And when we looked at that, we thought, well, in balance, he doesn't need to say those things so directly. We can do it by inference. And therefore, you, you take those pieces of sync out. You know? And that's another balance you have to put in. Then on a physical level, we made sure that for each of the contributors, we had a monitor for them. So someone who's going to see them on a daily basis 
for the first two or three weeks after transmission. We contacted the South African Embassy and we secured asylum for them if we, re if we required it. And we went and applied for passports for all of them. So each one of them had the option to leave if they needed to do so. We had also negotiated, it took a while, but we negotiated a fund with the BBC who um, commissioned this film to, to put to the side um, a, a budget allocation within our budget to be able to relocate them if we needed to. But it depends on situation to situation. When we made China Stolen Children for Channel 4, the, the, there was a parents who spoke out um, about the regime saying that their child was kidnapped and no one was doing anything about them. The best way to protect them was actually for us to go in at the very onset and give, make up a charity and say that we are a charity and have a charity line and give them a card so that at any one point they had plausible deniability. And that was the safest protection. So this wasn't something we could then mention that we ever did because the minute we did and we advertised it um, or put it into press reports, everyone would know. So there are various different ways you can approach that. Uh, can I ask a question? I think that's fantastic. I mean, is this stuff that you've just initiated on, as a filmmaker with the sort of sense of responsibility of your subjects, or is that something that, the, that, the, that your broadcasters come in to say we need to set up protocols to protect subjects? No, it's, it's a mixture. I mean, the, the channels, I mean, certainly working with Channel 4, they're very, very strict on their protocols. Um, but I mean for the subjects, like monitoring the subjects after transmission, right? You mean it's always, it's, yeah, it's, it's monitoring subjects before, during, and after transmission is always a, is always a strong focal discussion point. Certainly I have with Kevin when if we make It's not something that, we've, that I've come across in the U.S., which I think is really... It's significant because that moment where millions of people see something. I think so because, I mean, at the end of the day, as a filmmaker, I have a choice. Do I go there or do I not? I mean, I'm filming with some kids in England at the moment, an 11-year-old. We came up in discussion about the fact that I went to Zimbabwe and I said, yeah, we filled out this 57-page security protocol. And he turned to me and he said, wait a minute, you said you've got common sense. I said, yeah. He said, but you filled out 57 pages on why you shouldn't film in that country. That doesn't sound very sensible to me. <laughs> Fair dues. But... Ultimately, I choose to make that risk and go in there, but the contributor is often not fully aware of the risks that they are letting themselves into. Now, again, you mustn't be too condescending, because there are plenty of incredibly intelligent and astute people out there in other countries who know completely what they're getting involved to. And that's when you start to really have a debate over the lines you draw. You know, if you've got an activist in a country who wants to speak out, should you be denying them that right by saying, no, it's against protocol, it's against, you know, the, the broadcasters shouldn't do that, it's wrong for us because we might get fall back on that. So you have to work together with the broadcaster, with the contributor, with your own agenda to work out what's the... It's just interesting, uh, just to say, uh, there's that book written about the journalist and the murderer, yeah. you know, and that whole thing about the relationship between journalists, and that's what I'm also what I'm saying about being every form of journalism is embedded, is predicated on trust, and therefore ultimately the end, the kind of unfolding of that trust or a betrayal of that trust somehow. It's kind of interesting. And, you know, you can get it. It's so hard to know, don't you think, when to premeditate that in any way? It, it is. And I think that that, that goes through, through every line of, of filmmaking because, it, interestingly, the debate that's come out of this particular film is not about how we operated undercover and the risks we did with the CIO. The most interesting debate um, that's come out of it is, is about when do you actually step in and help your contributor, which will have evolved with everybody in the room. I'm sure at some point that, that there would be, um, you know, the classic case in Pakistan floods where the journalist helped one child and then everyone said, are you going to help me? And uh, that came up in this film because ultimately this was a film about education and there were kids in it and it was 50p to reschool uh, to to put these kids back into education, and we didn't. We stood back and made the film. And, and so I think that's another issue that comes up in all our lines of, of, of work is, you know, at what point do you step in? At what point do you feel that for, for say, Grace Michelle's father, that you should forcibly, or not forcibly, but in, actively encourage him to leave the country? Or do you let him stay there and risk that you can get him out as and when something happens? And just to round that up then, so um, what was the fallout from that film? What happened to the contributors? Um, luckily, the fallout was, n was nothing towards the contributors. Everything was aimed at Kaliswa um, who, and myself, who, who neither of us are very welcome there. Do you, do you use geo filters, like website? Geo blocking. Geo -blocking. Yeah, blocking. Yeah, but the web undermines that. Yeah, it does. Do? Yeah. 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 Yeah, sorry, geo blocking is uh, where you can block your 
proper transmissions for to certain countries. So you sometimes make an agreement that if you're going to make a film with people in, say, Nigeria, they don't want to see it broadcast in Nigeria, and they'll talk to you because they feel that's a form of protection. What's slightly undermining about that is people who load up the films on YouTube so they can still be seen in Nigeria, but there's a sort of tension yeah. in that now. I mean, also, you can pretty much have a given that if you're working with the CIO, I mean, the country I worked in, China, Zimbabwe, and Gaza, with the CIO, Mossad, and sure. Chinese intelligence, I'm pretty certain they're going to get a DVD oh, of the no, film. Not, well, yeah, all the yeah. ambassadors, <laughs> all the embassies. <laughs> We're going to move swiftly on. Um, thank you for that. Um, James Brabazon uh, is next. Um, we're going to see a short clip from uh, Liberia, A Journey Without Maps. After another battle, a prisoner lies dying in town. You are cash on the main road, on the front, on the front line. This episode, disturbing and devoid of any redemption, is all the more sinister because these are not Liberian soldiers. Both the man who died fighting for the government and the rebels who killed him and who will now butcher him are from neighboring Sierra Leone. They can help you make the protection strong when you eat your enemy, when you eat a hat. I original son of I'm eating a hat. But it makes you stronger if you do that, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it will make my protection. This bloody encounter is reminiscent of the war in Sierra Leone, which ended in peaceful elections in May last year. Yet exactly the same troops from both sides of that war continue to fight here in Liberia. Panicky and scared, the town's population are prepared to flee at a moment's notice. These pictures show one of the many false alarms that sent civilians running from town. By the 17th of July, the evacuation is for real. Down to my last few minutes of camera battery, I cannot film the exodus. Almost completely out of ammunition, the rebels decide to withdraw from Tubmanburg. I follow them out, along with 400 civilians. Over the following 10 days, we'll walk 300 kilometers, narrowly surviving the ambushes that lie in wait for us. Finally, crossing into Guinea, I walked out of the war, a journey Liberia seems unable to make itself. So James, would you do that again now? That's what, six, seven years ago, a bit more? Yeah, I was in 2002. Um, is it, is, is it, are you, are you capable of doing that sort of filmmaking now? Um, God, that's a really, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> um, you know, when, when I made that film, it was, um, it was a sort of career defining film because it, it really began my career as a filmmaker. And, um, I, you know, obviously I was a bit younger and I really had something to gain by exposing myself to that risk. And I think the way in which people calibrate risk is, um, filmmakers, journalists calibrate risk is based on many different contingent factors. And at the time, you know, that was, that was really important for me was to establish myself um, in the industry. But also, you know, when I went into that war, it was, a, it was a truly unique circumstance. It was a very unusual position to be in that no other journalists um, had gone in to um, Liberia onto the rebel side. Um, I mean, really serious, credible regional commentators denied that the war was happening at all. It was a truly, totally unreported story that no one had seen. 
So to go in and film it and not only prove that the fighting was happening, but that, um, you know, to bring out physical evidence that Taylor was, Charles Taylor, the president of Liberia, was breaking international law by illegally importing weapons to document war crimes. Those things seem to me to be, as a filmmaker, the absolute, you know, as a journalist, the absolute crux of what our profession is about. I mean, it couldn't be any clearer to me. Um, and although I've worked in conflicts pretty much of one kind or another pretty much ever since, um, to subject myself to that level of violence again, I would need to feel very sure that the story itself was, um, was really worth it. And, you know, life evolves. When I went there, I, I was responsible for myself and myself only. Um, the third film that I went and made there, I took Tim Hetherington with me. And then I was, you know, by extension, responsible for Tim. Um, and, uh, you know, now I have two small children. So, you know, my outlook is somewhat different in terms of, there, there were periods of time involved in filming in Liberia where um, I, our survival, you know, one's survival was a statistical aberration. There was no sense or reason to it, so bullet travels a centimetre to the left or right is the difference between you living or not. And I, I really expected to die filming that. I, I really believed I would die and I expected to die doing it. Um, and, and I sort of made a kind of strange accommodation with that in a way. Um, that walk out, the journey out, the, the worst firefights, the worst thing, a lot of the worst things that happened were, were never filmed. You know, and it, it's a, it's a kind of, it's one of the real truisms of, of our profession is basically any idiot can get in anywhere on earth. The trick is getting out again with your material. There's no point being there and doing this if you don't bring the story out. The entire point of being there is to bring the story out. And I walked 300 kilometers out with the rushes and we were ambushed basically, I mean, every day. And it got to the point where you know, you either lie in the ditch and stay there, and the rushes stay there with you, and all of that's been pointless, or you get up into the middle of it and you, you know, run through, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to sound kind of sensible about this, but you run through, you know, a lot of incoming machine gun fire, and that's the only way you can get out. There isn't any other way of getting out. So, I don't, I, I would not knowingly go into an environment where I expected to die. Do you think those environments, um, what I was getting at is, <coughs> seems to me now th that filmmakers are much more fair game than they were even then. I mean, that's an extraordinary example mm. of, of an embed in some ways, Tim was saying, or access, mm. um, based on trust and based on some sort of understanding of why you were there. Do you get the sense now that that, that is harder to achieve, that you are, as a filmmaker now, much more perilously uh, engaged with people, that they are less keen to keep you around, less keen to have you follow them. Uh, that as a filmmaker, that isn't a protection anymore. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's partly um, the, the, the filmmaker as target, and here we are, don't shoot, I'm a filmmaker. I mean, there, there, this, there is, I think it cleaves into two mm. unequal parts. On the, on the one hand, there is the enduring problem that as um, a professional troublemaker, um, someone's going to be pissed off with what I'm doing, and if they're not, then I'm not doing my job properly. Well, in Liberia, Charles Taylor was extremely annoyed about what I was doing because he would say, well, our government troops control this area and the rebels don't, and I'd go in with the rebels and then get on a satellite phone and do an interview with the BBC World Service and say, well, I'm standing in the middle of it. And that prompted Taylor to um, order our execution, which was nicely picked up by GCXQ and passed on to us and two death squads were dispatched to, to, to uh, essentially Tim and I at that point to, come, to, to capture or, or kill us. Um, so that's, and that's, that's always been the problem if you're doing something, you know. But there's, there's been this development, um, and I'm, I'm very well aware that there are people here who can speak much better to this than I can. Um, having, but having worked in Iraq and in Afghanistan, um, the idea of the, the journalist as an impartial observer um, has dissolved to the point where you are inextricably identified as the enemy. 
and that can be by dent by dint of your ethnicity of your cultural backgrounds of the passport that you carry and there is no if you are facing a dynamic and radical um, ideology it's which is essentially irrational it's 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 profound and by its nature has to be irrational it's it's it, it's very difficult to talk your way through the roadblock as you're saying at the beginning I can deal with a, a stoned Liberian teenager who stuck a Kalashnikov in my face um, I interviewed a senior Al Qaeda commander in Mogadishu, as, as you well know, and whether we lived or died doing that interview was entirely up to him. Because there was no right, there was no conversation to say, you know. I mean, it's worth also, I think, noting that um, I mean, I think there's 70 or 80 journalists, filmmakers killed this year. And the majority of them tend to be local. Don't they? they tend to be the people who are there on the ground who are subject to um, you know, intimidation and mm. threats rather than the people who are flying in and out in, in, in one sense. I mean, that's another, you know, I mean, it, it's interesting actually that the way in which um, the nature and type of warfare that we're covering has evolved mm. um, in the last decade has also gone hand in hand with a technological evolution that makes it possible for um, local journalists to act um, much more easily than it was in the past because equipment is, is smaller, lighter, cheaper and also has very good um, production values associated with it. So when I was filming in Liberia it was really kind of one of the last old-fashioned wars. I mean, there were no mobile phones. There was no one shooting mobile phone footage of anything. There was no, there were no local journalists with like small um, camcorders. If you went back there, if this happened again now, and you went back, that would change. It would be the re how that conflict is reported. It wouldn't be a question of one person flying in from London to film it. Period. It would be a question of me contributing towards a total reportage that was predominantly led by Liberians and and that creates other issues and problems as well. What do you mean in terms of the safety for those people that you're, you're working with? Well, it creates um, issues of safety um, for the people that you work with. It also, um, the sort of, the, 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 it's not just that the means of capture have become cheaper and easier to use, but the means of dissemination have multiplied exponentially. And that creates issues with the credibility and authenticity of material that's put into the public domain and which is why I believe there is a very strong role for the terrestrial broadcast um, current affairs documentary because it goes through a series of legal um, filters and commissioning filters that are absolutely absent in, 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 uh, in other areas of, um, of, of news gathering. Um, we're going to have another clip. Um, this is from Laura Patras's film. Uh, it's The Oath, and it's Osama bin Laden's former bodyguard who drives a taxi um, talking about uh, his past.
نقلوني من كامب دلتا ووضعوني في زنزانة جديدة وكانت هذه الزنزانة داخل منزل مغلق ولم يسمحوا لي برؤية الشمس أو الحديث مع أي أشخاص خارج المنزل أو مع أي شخص إنني وحيد ولا أتحدث مع أحد في الزنزانة إنه لا يوجد أحد للتحدث معه إن الشهر هنا يمر كسنة وإنني أعاني من ألام في الظهر والقدم والهرش نتيجة العزل عن ضوء الشمس So yeah, um, uh, this is filmed in um, in Yemen, which is where the, the Abu Jandal, the taxi cab driver, is, and, and Guantanamo, as you see, where Salim Hamdan, his brother-in-law, is in prison. Um, this is actually a follow-up to a film that I made in in Iraq about the about the occupation there. Um, that that are looking at post 9/11 issues, America post 9/11 issues. And in a certain way, the film I made in Iraq is probably more appropriate for the panel because it was actually really an active war zone where the idea of going out on the street, you really were thinking, was it worth risking your life to be out on the street? Where in Yemen, you know, despite the the sort of news reports, it's actually not an active war zone. I mean, you can go on the street and hail a taxi cab, and the taxi cab driver might be Bin Laden's former bodyguard. Um, so, um, I mean, with, in terms of, you know, the risks, I mean, what I've found in terms of working in the field, I mean, the way that I work is similar to Tim, is that I generate my own stories and I go into the field and then I look for funding. The funding usually comes later, particularly broadcast. Um, and pr I think with the Iraq film, I wouldn't have probably got um, a broadcaster on board because it probably, w they wouldn't have wanted to, to take on the liability. Um, and so what I found is sort of going into to the field um, you think you're going to make one kind of a film and then you get out there and you end up taking risks that you probably, in your right mind, wouldn't be making. It, but they somehow incrementally present themselves and then you cross these lines. And, and I think that that's happened in, in both films. And partly it's, um, it's a factor of seeing the, the risks that the people actually, you know, the locals, uh, the people who you're documenting, the risks that they're taking. I'm thinking particularly of working in Iraq where you see, um, you know, I was... I knew translators who had, you know, dozens of friends murdered in cold blood in front of them, never made a headline. You know as a U.S. journalist it's going to be at least a headline if you get killed. Um, and so you see these risks happening and you end up taking more. So when, um, when I was working in, in Iraq, I mean, the real, you know, there were you know, multiple sort of things to worry about, um, including being an American, working there, and the risks of kidnapping. And that was something that, you know, I tried to think of, like, what kinds of protocols would you take? So if you find yourself kidnapped, how do you get out of that situation? And sort of one of the things that I, I did when I was working, I'd filmed the scene at Abu Ghraib prison, and, and I never traveled without that footage, because I think the best way you can get out of a bad situation is try to explain what it is you're doing. And if you're perceived as a journalist, even though we are targets now, I think that um, there's also a, 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 an acceptance that journalists are doing a service, and I think that people perceive if you're able to show what it is you're doing. So I would always travel with that material. And then when the film was released, I never used the full names of the subjects who were in the film. And I actually didn't sell it to Al Jazeera when they wanted it until the... Because what I ended up doing in Baghdad was I... Um, I lived with an Iraqi family, so I was there, 2000, I was there from in 2004 and 2005 for about eight months. And I was moving between, I was, in, I was actually officially embedded with the U.S. military, but then I would leave the green zone and live with this Iraqi family in Baghdad. And so I would sort of move back and forth. And when the film was finished, I didn't release it in, on Al Jazeera until the family, f they felt it was safe to do it. And I also didn't use their, their names. In, in terms of working in Yemen, um, I, again, I didn't go there. I didn't leave home thinking I was looking for um, bin Laden's bodyguard. I, I, I actually just um, met him. And I thought, OK, you're driving a taxi cab? That's not what I expected to find. And, um, but I was, um, he's a really interesting character for a number of different reasons, both his involvement with, with bin Laden, the fact that he recruited Salim Hamdan is a very famous case in Guantanamo. Um, and there's a very significant interrogation he was interrogated less than a week after 9-11, and that interrogation was done um, by the book and was extremely um, significant. And as an American, and we know what's happened since then, like since 9-11, we know that we've set up black sites, we know that we've tortured people, you know, and we've legalized, legalized torture. I thought that this was a really important story to tell of this particular individual. And the stories that I'm trying to do are trying to look at these sort of big themes, but how 
when they're sort of grounded in human experience? And how do we understand these big issues differently once they are embodied? Um, and, and with Salim Hamdan's character, who's the, the writing the letter from Guantanamo, I mean, I really went to Yemen looking for a story about Guantanamo. And what I really wanted to do, or the goal as a filmmaker, was how do you get beyond these kind of images of dehumanization? So we have the images of Abu Ghraib, or we have the images of Guantanamo detainees in orange jumpsuits. And that's kind of what we understand. And so as a filmmaker, what I'm trying to do is how do you move outside of those images in a different kind of a way that actually um, uh, the audience can actually relate to the events that they're witnessing, and um, which isn't to sort of forgive what people do, but actually to be able to, to understand in a different kind of more complex and human way. And so that's, you know, the sort of um, device of using these narrative letters was kind of a way to bring his story um, into it in a different kind of a way and sort of break down those. And then uh, obviously the biggest um, concern working in Yemen for me as an American was, you know, again, the, the fear of being kidnapped. And um, maybe not directly, I mean, if, with Abu Jandal, he was never fully you know, trustworthy, so you didn't quite know where I stand. But I wasn't that worried about him. But certainly, there, there, there are other, um, you know, players there that are quite dangerous, and uh, and so it was how to navigate that. Well, and how, how did you navigate that? Because wa waving a roll of rushes at Abu Ghraib doesn't seem to be perhaps the safest way of trying to... I, what do you have, like, who's, I mean, I think, you know, who's the best person to negotiate for you if you do get kidnapped? I mean, I did have that person in mind and you know um, so there's one way I negotiated it um, but you, you it sounds to me you feel it feels like a very lonely place to be um, in you're, the field you're, doing you're, this kind you're of on work your own, um, yeah, for sure. you know there's a risk quite a high risk yeah. that you've got value right. um, and yet still you go and take that risk yeah 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 I mean and I don't think um, I, I, I mean, uh, right now, sort of, um, as as an American citizen, you know, I I think you know, this sort of repercussions of 9/11 should be documented, and the risk that I take, I actually have a lot of protection as well. Holding a U.S. passport is, you know, is hugely, um, you know, also gives you gives you kinds of protections. But uh, you know, there there are definitely things to worry about, and then I've also had to worry about the U.S. government because mm -hmm. after I finished the film in Iraq, I started having tr difficulties traveling, which have sort of escalated. They didn't um, um, go down after I made the film in Yemen, um, and so to the point of where I routinely have my notebooks photocopied when I return to the United States, and recently. My computer was confiscated for two months, and uh, and so I don't, you know. So there there are these kind of sort of managing these risks, but I think it should be, you know, I think we should be documenting this, you know, this history. I mean, I think that's our job. Okay, um, we're going to have to move on quickly uh, because I'd like to give us some questions at the end, but I'd certainly like you to see silencing the song, which is Havana Markings' follow up to Afghanistan, uh, which was, uh, I'm sure you've all seen a fantastic film. Um, so can we run a bit of that, please? Yes. 
گناو پیدا شد بازگیری ها کرد او را شکم کشیدن بازگیری ها هم کرد آوازش هم در حالتی که بیوش هم بودم بل آوازش شنیدم دیگر باز اونو پسانش هم برای ما بردن یک دفعه او را دیدم بازگه بردن شفاخانه پیش اطفالا بردن بختری که اکسیجن ضرورت دیش So Havana, do you want to do you want to explain how you came across Satara and then why you went back to find it? Um, yeah, so Satara was one of the characters that was in Afghanistan. Um, she became the central character in the end because of of, uh, of her actions during performing on the, the Afghan version of Pop Idol. Um, she danced on stage and then she had to go into the... the created a huge furore and um, uh, she had started having death threats against her but also sort of government and, and local sort of officials pronouncing how, how bad she was. So in that film, I'd actually gone into to hiding with Sitara during that period as well, um, and had obviously become very close uh, to, to her during that time. Um, but she had, you know, she'd survived that, that period um, and uh, had actually then left Afghanistan. She had, after my first film, she'd left Afghanistan to go to Kazakhstan to for, for, uh, follow a music career there. Um, and so then when HBO uh, put out Afghan, Afghan Star, they wanted just a really short update. Um, so I f got in touch with Satara again, found out where she was, blah, blah, blah. She's now, she was pregnant, she was back in Kabul, she'd gone back to Kabul to be with her husband. Um, and she was really happy and it was all an exciting time. So uh, we started following her again from about seven months, when she was seven months pregnant, thinking that it was just going to literally be a... Uh, just a film with a happy ending, really. Um, and really, I think the point of, of uh, on this panel and part of this panel to, to, to point out is that, I mean, in Afghanistan, I'd had lots of, again, security protocol, kidnap threat, all these things you had to think about. Um, and then I made a second film called Vote Afghanistan, um, which we made for, for more for, which again, huge. We were following political candidates in the elections. There was this huge social, you know, uh, safety protocols. And for this one, literally, I had honestly just thought that I was just, oh, it's easy, I'm going to go back to Kabul. Uh, it's, it, I, I know my way around, everything's easy, nothing's going to go wrong, we're just going to, it's going to be easy. Of course, the point of these countries is that they are absolutely unstable, and they're unstable in, in all sorts of different ways. It's not just conflict, that's, that's you know, part of these countries is that they're, they're hugely poor, there's no medical facilities, healthcare is just zero. Obviously, if you're a woman, you're, you've got, you're, you're a victim on all fronts. Um, at the same time, when I was there, there turned out to be a, a it was the really horrible um, UN a, attack on a UN guest house when they targeted um, foreigners. So exactly at the time when we were in the hospital, there was, everyone was on lockdown. Um, and the whole sort of city was, was in, in a state of, of sort of trauma. 
And at the same time, again, there were two earthquakes which happened, which that, in a way that, that shook me more than anything because it, I was like, Jesus, the earth is furious as well. You know, we, we're really in trouble here. We've got a baby dying, the, attacking the thing, and the earth is about to swallow us up. Um, and it was actually, having considered that this would be the easiest film to make, it was actually the hardest, obviously. I was very emotionally attached to Satara. Being there in that hospital was, was just awful. You're in a ward full of dying babies. And I think it's probably different from news in that you're not in and out. You, you, I knew Satara, I knew everything. I knew all about how important this baby was to her and, and, and how her life was, was absolutely, uh, had, you know, she'd given up everything, her whole new freedoms that she'd, she'd had in, in Kazakhstan, she'd given up to come back to Kabul. So I just knew all the implications of this baby and the, and the life of this baby. Um, and in the end, it, very sadly, the baby did die. It was a it was a hugely sort of traumatic experience, and so I think the 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 thing to kind of remember is that you 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 cannot predict anything in these countries. The things that you think are predictable, you know, even the Earth, you think that's going to be all right. It's not. It's 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 they're unstable across the board. Um, the other thing I think it would be important to say that in, in Kabul there's obviously there's a sort of strong sort of journalist uh, presence and there are certain bars where all the journalists go and at moments like this, at moments of traumas, people particularly sort of um, head to these particular bars. And so the reaction that I was having was to get absolutely hammered at night, which was what everyone around me was doing. And that made it 10 times worse to have to go in and, and you know, I mean, I stopped after, after a couple of nights. I was like, okay, I've got to, I've got to be sober for this, this period because it's, it's, that is not a way to deal with these pressures. But these, these pressures are big and can't be uh, underestimated. Um, and when I got back, I actually, I, I had no idea at the time. I mean, the film is, it's a very powerful film for the reasons that, you know, where you can see. Um, but when I came back, I didn't want to pick up a camera for, I mean, for about three months, I just didn't want anything to do with it. I, I, I just thought, how can I, do I want to be the sort of person that is not emotionally affected by these things? Do I want to just be cool and calm and collected in these situations? And uh, I don't, I don't want to be that sort of person. Um, and can you tell us a little bit of, about your relationship with Satara now? She's obviously been in two films. Yeah. The first one obviously caused her some uh, issues, and then the second one, you're filming an emotion, very emotional moment for her. Yeah. Um, where, where, what's your relationship with her now? Well, it's, it is quite difficult to keep up with people in Afghanistan because as soon as a phone number changes, there's, mm. there's, it's very hard to stay in touch. But um, I, I'm in touch by uh, people through uh, Tolo TV, who are the TV company that made Pop Idol in the fir out there, Afghanistan, in the first place. Um, so the last that I heard, well, actually, there's 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 two things that the the I heard at one point I heard that um, she divorced the husband and then the husband's family were threatening to kill her. So that was the the this was about uh, well, it was about a month ago. And um, so then I spent, but the, now rumor in Afghanistan and gossip in Afghanistan is really rife. And you cannot, I mean, I learn all the time, people are always saying, oh, so-and-so's been killed, and they haven't been. Or, you know, there's just always this thing. So you're always trying to find out what is the truth, is, is, is a threat a real threat, what's the real situation. So I was, I was running around trying to find out the situation from her and uh, um, uh, trying to see if there were safe houses she could go to or, or something like that. Um, and, but then the next thing I heard was that Tolo TV, she'd come into Tolo TV and she was recording a new album. I mean, literally the next week I heard that. So that, that's where we're up to with her. Um, but I mean, she needs constant, uh, su surveillance is the wrong word, but she, she's someone that trouble happens to. Yeah. She's outspoken and she's, she's, she is, she's always at risk. I mean, if I could get her out, I would love to. I would love to. She shouldn't be there. But I haven't found a way around that yet. OK. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I was going to uh, open it up to questions. Uh, but apparently, there's a roving microphone on somewhere. Um, so you don't have to shout. Um, does, does anybody have any questions for the panel? 
Oh, hi there. Um, Sharon Ward, Catalyst Productions, also make films in Afghanistan recently, most recently working with a young Afghan filmmaker, uh, Jawad Taiman, about child addiction in Afghanistan called Addicted in Afghanistan. I'm just wondering about um, getting stories from indigenous filmmakers, particularly on the ground in Afghanistan, and how open you are all to working with indigenous filmmakers, or would you rather stay from a Western perspective, or is there any collaboration? Going on, for example, you talked about in Iraq. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word indigenous personally. I mean, I think yeah, that, yeah. people who um, are from that country. Yeah. So um, I worked with with somebody um, in Yemen who um, was a co-producer on the film, whose title would probably be for most um, Western fixer. But actually, he fixers. I mean, I think it's actually uh, it's also a very problematic term um, yeah. because they actually do all the producing work. So um, so he, you know, he was involved in in, in co-producing the film. But uh, you know, in, in terms of us as filmmakers, I think you're talking. We're you know, I think we're all sort of committed to being filmmakers, so I think we're, and I think we would also be su supportive to, yeah. you know, in the same way they are in the, within the documentary field in the West, to people who are doing, doing work locally, and I think that work really absolutely should be done and should be, I mean, I think it's actually more of a question for the commissioning editors than it is for the filmmakers here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I think accessing, pe accessing people who can get to places that the panel can't. Uh, we do that all the time. It's really important. Uh, it's important to to know that we treat those people in exactly the same way. It's about their safety. It's about what happens after we've gone, they've gone, what will happen to them. Um, but also, so it's not just about the position where the camera is. It's also just about what stories they can tell. They can often get an intimacy or an insight that you know, best will in the world. Uh, some some of the people up here can't do. So I mean, we've been doing that for quite a long time. It's very successful. Um, and I think we've, we've been inside Burma, we've tasked a Burmese cameraman, for example, to make a fantastic film. Uh, and then, again, the, the, what goes into making them safe, making the whole production safe, what happens afterwards in the aftermath of a broadcast like that, all those things are now uh, part and parcel of how we operate. Fantastic, great. Does anybody else have any... Has somebody right at the back? I think the, the issue moving forward is, is that accessing, um, accessing material, uh, James alluded to it as well, uh, in, in, as technology lightens, uh, as people use the internet, uh, using more people like that is a way forward. Uh, yeah, it's just a question on logistics for James. Um, how did you go about in terms of food and water and sort of medicine? Uh, I'm just thinking, when, when I went to India, I cleaned my teeth, I had diarrhea for pretty much three weeks. I had the most extraordinary intergalactic bout of diarrhea imaginable um, to the point where um, uh, I very nearly died from it, actually. It's horrible. Um, it's probably a question that everyone can answer, actually. And I think it, it, it goes back to, um, to what Havana was saying as well, is that actually um, being shot at on location is incredibly rare. Um, and although I seem to have um, a, some kind of genetic propensity as a bullet magnet, um, it is, it's very, very unusual. Um, actually, it's all the other stuff that will get you, starting with not putting your seatbelt on when you get in the taxi at the airport, which is statistically um, how you're going to end up in um, a third world A&E, or lack thereof. So it's, a, it's an entire process, and I always I sort of figure out that Working in a hostile environment is probably 70 to 80 percent logistics and 20 to 30 percent filming, and it's nailing the logistics um, that allows you to make the film. So, you know, it just in terms, in the, very briefly, in the Liberia situation, um, uh, we purified all of our drinking water, um, largely because um, obviously we had we had issues with collecting drinking water and a lot of um, water sources were polluted with dead bodies so that was quite difficult um, uh, with food um, I um, lost a very great deal of weight basically I ate um, uh, for three months I ate two mouthfuls of meat one fish um, no sugar no salt um, a bowl of rice a day and some chopped stewed cassava leaves, which actually um, took me a very long time to eat rice again when I came home. But it's it's extremely debilitating physically. I mean, to the point where because there's no sugar in the diet, when you stand up, you want to black out. So it's it's quite it's one thing being sort of shot at at people by close range and trying to film it. It's another doing it when you 
haven't eaten that day and there isn't much prospect of eating that day. And I think actually um, kind of enduring those privations um, was one of the things, and I, I don't know if other people find this true as well, but it's, it's one of the things that allowed the access I had to the rebels. You know, I, ate, I marched with them, I ate the same food that they did, um, I slept in the same places that they did, I went into combat um, filming them in a t-shirt like they did, and I think that it was that e equality of experience in some respects um, over that three month period um, that really brought us together because you know we were all hungry and we were all tired and you know um, so it was it's you can't sort of cleave off different bits it's it's a working in a difficult environment is it's a total filmmaking experience otherwise known as cooking in the danger zone um, <laughs> one thing it's worth just re remembering and I was looking at the statistics on the way the way up here um, a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, filmmakers and journalists who are killed are simply murdered um, they're not uh, blown up in combat uh, they you know in fact the percentages are extraordinary and actually the countries where journalists and filmmakers are killed are quite surprising um, and you know Sri Lanka uh, Mexico the Philippines not necessarily, you know, holiday destinations to some extent, uh, are places where huge numbers of journalists are simply murdered. Um, they are doing their jobs in little small towns uh, covering a drug war in Mexico or whatever. It's always worth remembering that we're talking about, in a way this has been about going to the big dangerous places, mounting really big films that uh, do very well around the world. But actually the day-to-day the day-to-day -day experience of safety, if you want, uh, for journalists is much more mundane. And it is about, it is about being killed in Mexico because you try to expose the drug lords. Um, and if you go to any of the sort of um, journalist reporting sites, you'll see quite extraordinarily uh, the disparity between four people, four journalists, filmmakers killed in Iraq, 30 killed in the Philippines. Or you'll see 10 in Mexico and you'll see four in Afghanistan. Isn't to, it just gives you a bit of a perspective that there's a different way of seeing this. Is that day in, day out around the world, um, filmmakers who are local are simply being killed because they're, as James said, want to cause a little bit of trouble and they want to find things out. Um, so it is worth just having a look around at, at um, some of the quite odd, some of the holiday destinations. It's quite surprising to find out where you might not want to go as a filmmaker. And it's one of the things we found out is that some places we never thought were dangerous turned out to be far more dangerous uh, than the places we really thought were dangerous. Um, is there any, anybody else have any, I believe, uh, Mr. Langan at the back there? Uh, hi. Um, it's, uh, it's, been, it's quite clear the, the, the traumas, the intensities you've gone through, uh, but there's a war you, and a conflict uh, often far more traumatic you haven't talked about, which is the, the fight you have back in your homes, getting the films made, uh, controlling your rights. Uh, I thought James's 300 kilometer walk dealing with the ships and firing squads was a metaphor for a, uh, a filmmaker. Uh, I was just wondering, Kevin's obviously a very honorable exception, uh, and, no, but really you are. And Kev, uh, we, we've all often relied on uh, individuals. It's like, I think we can all count uh, the commissioning editors who, who support these films and filmmakers on one hand, not two. I was just wondering then from some of the, the people up there who I know have faced incredible difficulties both making the films but also controlling their rights and earning a living. So from both sides, I was just wondering, you know, for the filmmakers, what have they found? You know, when Kevin asked James, would you do that film again? Uh, would you go through the whole process of trying to get a film made again is, is, is one question. But I'm wondering, Kevin, if what, uh, what's it from your perspective? How do you see it uh, in this day and age? It's incredibly hard with uh, the pressures on broadcasters for ratings and uh, et cetera. You know, is there still room to have films such as these people make in this sort of, you know, they're very rarefied films in this day and age? I, th I think there is, and I think, well, I can only speak for Channel 4, but I'm obviously, uh, Jez has had a fantastic film on the BBC. Um, I think there's, there's a, there is an audience and there's a demand. Uh, it's by no coincidence a lot of the, those sorts of films win all the big international awards, get international recognition. I think that public service element uh, of these sorts of films uh, is A, important, and B, the people want to see them. I mean, Restrepo, 
you know, seems to be taking cinemas by storm. It's got extraordinary reviews. Uh, you know, your, your own films got an incredible notice when they came out. I think there is a commitment uh, across public service broadcasting. I think it's harder when you're trying to put money together. You know, you're, you're trying to put money together to, to get a project that hasn't got a broadcaster. So how, where are you then? And you, in a way, what we were talking about there is the risk you're prepared to go to as a freelance filmmaker with no great backup from a broadcaster to put yourself at risk to try and get a story that you may not get the money back on. I mean, I think that's a, an extraordinary uh, risk to take. Um, you know, it's not something we ever encourage. You know, we were very clear that if someone is going to make a film, we're right behind you and you're going to make that film with us because we know the scale of the input we, that's needed. So I think in terms of broadcasters, I think broadcasters like the BBC, like Channel 4, like HBO, uh, and um, like Frontline in America, they, they are very keen on, on you know, a large number, number of hours a year from very, from very difficult places made by some of the people on, on, on this panel. I think the difficulty from an indie's perspective, though, independent company's perspective, is, is sort of, the, 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 with most broadcasters, it's about timing. So a film that you have, say, Zimbabwe's Forgotten Children, a film on Zimbabwe, if the time is not right, if it's not, you know, if the season they've got produced or it's a country that was done last year, then that film will not get commissioned. And you'll have a raft of films from that in, in, in that lineup within the company. And so it's about when do you give up on those ideas and just move on? And how long do you keep going with it? Because it actually took three years to get Zimbabwe commissioned. Um, and it, over those three years, it developed, but the, the, the access was always there. It was Kalisa's access that we had that we felt was our prize nugget. And over the history of Zimbabwe in the last three years, you can see there's been all sorts of issues that were the, the ones that came up. I mean, ultimately, I think as a long-form filmmaker, as a documentary, the film we ultimately produced was the best one for that slot. And there were some great dispatches in between. Um, but it's, there are other um, countries where we have film ideas that we come up with, and it's how long do you keep, you know, in some respects, flogging a dead horse, or is it a dead horse, and has it still got a bit of life in it? And I think that's the difficulty. And I think that's really difficult when you move then into an independent filmmaker, because time and time again, I get talked to by students who have this idea, who've then moved into the industry, and they're now becoming APs, and they have ideas, and they want to move into the next level, but they're still trying to sell the film that they wanted to make back in their uni days, and it's sort of five years on. And when do you draw that line? You know, and I think that's difficult. Uh, I mean, I would say in terms of my own work, I, I mean, these are projects I always hold the rights. I don't, I don't think I would take the risks if I, if I didn't have uh, the rights, hold the rights, and have, you know, editorial control. Um, and, uh, you know, there have been plenty of people who have asked me to go into the field and shoot for them. And, you know, they're, they're not, you know, jobs that I've taken, uh, you know, as a shooter. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, just to speak to a little bit of the pain that Sean's referring to there, <laughs> Um, when I was three weeks into making that film in, in, um, in Liberia, um, the production company that sent me there went bust. So I had a slightly awkward telephone conversation with the managing director who told me that um, uh, not only was I not going to get paid, um, but that um, the heavily armed South African mercenary who was my bodyguard was also not going to be paid, um, which is an interesting conversation to have surrounded by 400 rebels and no one else on your side. Um, also, as well, um, to be honest, uh, because the contracts for the cameraman and the sound man expired, so I went in as a producer, though I didn't really understand what that meant, having been a stills photographer up until precisely that moment, um, uh, they walked out injured and um, somewhat fed up with the whole enterprise. Um, and as the cameraman left, um, he gave me a little mini, mini digital um, TV camera, a box of tapes, a couple of batteries and a charger and said, good luck, mate. So um, that film it happened because that was the only way of carrying on with it. Was, that was the first thing I did. But the, coming back from it, walk, the, your, the, the walk out with the rushes, coming back to um, London, um, suffering from, um, from post a very strong post-traumatic stress reaction um, and really struggling to maintain my grip on, on my own sanity to then stand in 
the offices of every single person in London who could possibly have bought that footage and for them all to turn it down um, and to end up going back home and sitting with a little box of tapes on the table and to think of the extreme carnage that one waded through to come back with that and the, the, the personal cost of it to think, well, it's actually never going to go on TV anyway. What, what, was, what, frankly, was the fucking point of that? Because if you're there to tell the story and then there's no way to disseminate the story, what do you do? And we have time for probably one more question um, um, before we have to vacate. Let me just, I also want to comment, but I don't know. I mean, I do think it's a real question. I mean, is it worth doing this? I mean, I'm not really sure. I mean, it doesn't seem to make a difference. I mean, there are wars happening all over the place. People are dying, and, and we're all still, like, taking these risks. And I, th I think it actually is a real question, if it's worth doing it, you know? I mean, obviously, when I'm out there, I always think it is, but I'm not sure. It's quite, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, well, <laughs> okay. it, 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 sometimes it's... Some, this is mass retirement, is it? <laughs> sometimes it's not worth it, but other times it is. Sometimes the other films don't have the result they have, but then we always run on the premise that at least if you can change one mind, it can snowball and change more. When we did Zimbabwe, we, I was asking that. It's the very same question at the end of it. Was it all worth it? Everything we went through to do it, we produced this film what happens and actually what's happened since that film went out is that a foundation that we set up raised £53,000 which has gone into re-educating those children that took part and it was also working in the communities but even bigger than that because it was repeated on BBC2 SOS Children's Villages have now received a quarter of a million pounds in pledges to, to their funds so that's now helping villages across Africa and the world, you know, and that's monumental, you know, that's massive, that you couldn't hope for more than that, and so it has made a physical change on that level. I think, I think also as well, I'm going to speak for myself, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's on the one hand, it's very, it's very good and noble to talk about the sort of, you know, telling the story and being there to bring the story out, and that's the only reason to be there, but I think that um, at a very, I mean, certainly myself, at a very profound personal level, there are other, perhaps much less um, noble motivations for going to war and to want to keep going back to war. And I am under very few illusions about what drove me, certainly at the beginning of my career, which had a, a lot to do with um, a young man wanting to experience that environment for, for personal reasons, probably more than professional ones. We're going to have to wind it up there, I think. Um...